Hello, ladies, gentlemen, and non-binary friends. Welcome to today's Worth Electronic webinar, powered by DigiKey Electronics, the exclusive sponsor of all Worth Electronic webinars. I'm your host, Amelia Thompson, and I am happy to be back in sunny South Dakota, where the weather is finally starting to warm up because we are in mid-April, but know that we're probably going to get some more snow. I am seeing a few other names that I know are in the Midwest. I hope you guys are uh, enjoying your sunshine as well. And I'm really happy for you to be here today. And seeing some uh, returning names from previous webinars as well as last year's webinars. So thank you for joining us. Uh, today's webinar is Introduction to Capacitor Technologies, of course, partnered with DigiKey Electronics and presented by our own Thomas Frazek. He's a business development manager for the capacitors and resistors division at Worth Electronic right across the pond. Now, because you are attending today's webinar, the slides have been made available to you. So please feel free to follow along. Now, if you have any questions during today's webinar, please ask them in the questions box and we'll try to get to them after the webinar. If we don't get to them, no worries, we will answer them offline. And if you think of a question a little bit later, feel free to email us at webinarteam at we-online.com. Uh, also, because you registered for today's webinar, you will automatically receive the video on demand link. It'll be available within the next couple of days and you will receive a link in our follow-up email webinar team at we-online.com. Don't forget to register for next week's power webinar. We are teaming up with On Semi to bring you 25 kilowatt bi-directional fast DC charger partnered with uh, DigiKey Electronics and we will include that registration link in the follow-up email. Otherwise, you can find it at www.we-online.com slash webinars. I'm now going to hand it over and let's begin today's webinar, uh, Worth Electronic webinar with Thomas Frezek, Introduction to Capacitor Technologies, partnered with DigiKey Electronics. Um, hello. Let me start by welcoming you all to today's um, Introduction to the Capacitor Technologies. Thank you, Amelia, for the kind introduction. Here you can see our agenda for today. We'll start uh, by reviewing the technical basics and providing an overview of what kind of technologies you can find in the market. And then we'll go through the technologies one by one. Um, we start with the MRCC technology, then we go on with the film capacitors. After that, we'll talk about aluminum capacitors. And finally, uh, we will come to the supercapacitors. Um, I'd like to conclude by um, providing a short summary of the main topics for each um, technology, the main things you have to consider for them. And after that, there's time for some questions from your side. All right, let's jump in. Um, first of all, um, a capacitor consists out of two plates with a defined um, surface area and um, a defined distance of the plates from one another, and also a defined dielectric. Um, um, as you can see the formula, um, epsilon times A divided by D. So um, that means it basically the bigger the surface area, the more capacitance you can put in the same capacitor, but also it makes the capacitor bigger. Um, if you limit the distance between the plates, um, the capacitance will also increase but this comes at the cost of a voltage rating. So you have to um, lower down the voltage for that. And um, then of course, you also have the dielectricum, which depends on the material you use. There you have epsilon zero, which is a constant. So there's not much we can change about that. But for epsilon R, um, this is a, based on the material, it has quite a significant effect. You can see on the right, there's a table. And if you use vacuum or air, it's pretty much one. But then there are some other materials you can use to increase the um, capacitance. So you can see there are some um, plastic materials like the um, polystyrene, polypropylene, and um, polyethylene, um, which can provide more capacitance in the same size. And um, this is one kind of technology used for film capacitors. Then you can also see the next important one is aluminum oxide, which is used for aluminum capacitors, which um, provide quite a bit more permittivity. 
then you've also got the tantalum, which is the used um, dielectricum, the niobium, and then of course the ceramics class. Here there's a distinction between uh, class one ceramics and class two ceramics. They provide different levels of um, permittivity, so capacitance, but they uh, also have some drawbacks, um, which I'll display, explain further in a minute. All right, um, next, um, every capacitor has its uh, parasitic side effects along with them. So you have the um, leakage resistance or isolation resistance, then you have the ESR and also the ESL. And you can see um, on the right, um, if you put it over the frequency, um, the resistance goes up for the um, um, ESL but goes down for the ESR and for the uh, capacitor XC. So uh, in total, you have the red line for the impedance and there you know which is the um, best um, frequency range to use your capacitor in. Um, okay, so far for the basics. Um, now let's uh, get into a little, view of, a little bit of an overview. Here you can see um, capacitors are generally distinguished in fixed capacitance capacitors and variable capacitance capacitors. For the variable, um, you have the rotary capacitors and the trimming capacitors. These are rather small markets um, as we tend to use the other types in, in much, much higher volumes. Um, when it comes to fixed capacitors, you have of course the film capacitors, which come with paper film or plastic film. Then you have of course the ceramic capacitors where you have class one and class two ceramics. There are also the electrolytic um, capacitors where you have the aluminum electrolytics. Um, then there's the tantalum, which provides a higher um, permittivity as shown and also the niobium. And then there are supercapacitors which come as EDLCs, electronic double layer capacitors, pseudo capacitors or hybrids, which basically only have a difference in their um, um, anode and cathode but not in the operation modes. Um, there are mica capacitors, which are suitable for high frequencies and high currents, uh, high voltage levels, but um, are rather big in size. So they are not as used as frequently as other types. Um, glass is not used as much anymore as it has limited um, permittivity. And lastly, there are feed through capacitors for feed through applications for high frequencies. Um, all right, in the next slide, um, I provided a little bit of a um, comparison between the major um, important technologies. Um, we distinguish between the capacitance, the voltage, and the current ratings mainly. So aluminum electrolytic capacitors can be produced in pretty much any uh, size. So they provide a huge range when it comes to capacitance and also voltage, but they have a limited um, max current capability. Um, polymer capacitors uh, are similar, but they are limited in their maximum production size, which limits um, the max capacitance and also the max voltage. But they do have a better um, current capability as their ESR is lower. Um, there are also hybrid polymer capacitors, which provide a little bit of the advantages of the previous mentioned technologies. Um, they are, because of the polymer, as part of them, limited in size, and um, they provide a little bit more voltage range than the polymers, but the same um, current capability. There are also film capacitors, um, which have a limited capacitance as their um, permittivity is um, limited, as shown in the table before, but they do provide advantages when it comes to the voltage range and they also have a good um, current capability. Uh, next big technology are the MSCCs. They are also, um, there's a max size you can produce as the bigger they become, the more susceptible they are to um, um, cracking. So breaking of the inner, internal um, structure. Um, so you can provide the biggest capacitance per size, but as the size is limited, the capacitance in total is limited. Um, they have very good um, max voltage range and also um, very good uh, current capability. They also have a cons uh, 
considerable um, advantage when it comes to the operating temperature ranges. Uh, lastly, there are supercapacitors, um, specifically EDLCs, which have a very big uh, capacitance value, but this comes at the cost of a limited um, voltage range. Um, here you can see uh, 3.3 volts. Um, anything you see above that is usually two um, supercapacitors already in a module together. You will see sometimes a 5.5 or 5.4, 5 volt. And this is usually a module of two already set in series. Um, yeah, they have a good um, current capability when you compare them with batteries, where they are sometimes used to replace them. But considered with the other techno uh, capacitor technologies, they are um, medium. Yeah, um, they are somewhat susceptible when it comes to high temperatures, as this um, speeds up the aging. I'll show this to you um, later on. All right, so far with the overview, now I'll get a little bit more to the MLCCs. Um, here you can see the internal structure of an MLCC. Um, you see there are internal electrodes and uh, they are from both sides. And in between, you'll find a ceramic. It can be either a class one ceramic, which are ma mostly made of titan oxide or a class two ceramic, which is barium titan oxide. And um, this defines the capacitance. Um, on the sides, you of course see the termination with first a layer of copper, then a, a layer of nickel, and then tin. Um, as you can see, we try to stack uh, multiple layers on top of one another to increase the surface area. This will, as mentioned previously, increase the capacitance we can put in each size. You can see on the right side, there are quite a few layers stacked on top of each other to maximize this effect. Also, uh, we try to um, limit the distance between these plates to increase the capacitance further. To enhance a view, you can see a little bit of a close up here. Um, so this, of course, comes at the cost of the voltage range um, provided. Um, yes. So as I mentioned, the main material here is the class one or class two ceramics. And there are some key differences between them. I'll show you a little bit more about this now. So for the class one ceramics, you usually hear NP0 or COG. NP0 is a um, European name after the um, IEC um, 60384-21. And then in the American name, it's a COG usually, which is according to the EIA um, minus RS198 uh, regulation. Um, basically, the names uh, define it the same. There's no um, TCR value and a tolerance of plus minus 30 parts per million per degree Celsius, however. So the names are interchangeable. Um, class one ceramics um, have, a com uh, have a comparable smaller um, permittivity to the class two ones, which um, allows smaller capacitance value to be realized in the same size. They do have some advantages, however, as they are very linear over temperature. They barely have any aging um, that is uh, measurable. Uh, they have a very limited uh, of kind of no DC bias effect. And you can also use them for high frequency applications rather well. Uh, the class two ceramics on the other side, um, you mainly hear X7R, X5R, or Y5V. Um, X7R, this is all uh, according to the um, US standards, as the Europeans ones are not used anywhere. Um, the X5, X7R defines as the X is the negative temperature range for minus 55 degrees, the 7 for 125 positive range, and the uh, R defines the capacitance change to plus minus 15% over temperature. The X5R similar is just the positive temperature range is plus 85 degrees and the Y5V is um, minus 30 degrees up to um, plus 85 degrees and the capacitance change can change um, plus 22 degree, uh, percent and minus 82 percent, so quite significantly. So you see the further down you go, the more, uh, the higher the effect gets here. So they are, um, showing uh, dependencies when it comes to temperature. Um, 
they also have uh, aging and um, they are um, depending on the voltage. So they have a, a significant DC bias D rating. Um, to show you to that to you a little bit further, um, we go to this measurement here. You can see this on Red Expert. And you see in uh, blue, we have a class one ceramic. And you can basically see the entire capacitance is available over the entire voltage range. When you compare this to the orange line, which is in class two ceramic, you see the higher the um, voltage you apply, the smaller the actual, uh, actual capacitance you can use actually gets. So these effects depends on the ceramic you use. And um, it, as also, it's one other thing. It depends on the size of the part you use. For that, I have the following measurement here. Here you can see we compare four capacitors with one another. They all have the same X7R ceramic. They all have the same uh, capacitance value and the same voltage range. Um, and you see here in blue, you have the 80, size 1812, which is the biggest one. And um, when you go down, you see the green one is 1210. And then in orange, you have 1206. And in purple, you have 0805. And you can see um, the smaller the size of the part, the more significant the effect of this DC bias D rating actually is. So um, in our current um, market situation, there's a lot of downsizing going on, which you can do because a lot of times you can get the same value in a smaller size of uh, MLCC, but this will result in a loss of capacitance due to the DC bias effect being stronger here. So it's very important to take this into consideration. This is something you usually won't find in any data sheet, but some manufacturers um, do provide this data um, additionally to, to the data sheet. Um, and here you can see we uh, show them in our red expert. Um, Apart from the um, DC bias effect, there's also the aging of this MLCC. Um, for this, I have um, the graph on the left to show you. And you, here you can see um, the line in black is an NP0, so a class one ceramic. And you can basically see over a thousand hours, it has no loss in capacitance, so pretty much no aging. When you go down then to the red line, is an X7R ceramic, which is a highly um, stable class two ceramic. You see over 1,000 hours, it has about 2.5% uh, in capacitance loss. And this aging is per decade. So if you would uh, uh, calculate for 10,000 hours, you can double it. For 100,000 hours, you can triple it, and so on. This uh, um, applies to all um, ceramics here. Then in gray, you see the X5R ceramic, which has a stronger DC bias effect. Here you will lose about usually about four to six percent per thousand hours of the capacitance, and if you go further to um, poor quality um, ceramics, uh, you find, for example, Y5R, which has a loss of um, seven, over seventeen percent per thousand hours. And let's be honest, a thousand hours is not that long, so um, if you would were to double it, it's even more significant for ten thousand hours calculation. So this aging happens right after the parts are produced. So even if you store them for a long time, they will age. However, there is an upside there because um, the aging has to do with the atomical structure. And if you heat these parts over their Curie temperature point, which is usually around 130 degrees, you will basically um, refresh their atomic structure and then um, refresh the aging effect, basically. And the um, positive thing here is that usually if you solder these parts onto your PCB, um, they'll reach this Curie temperature. So basically, whenever you solder them, they will be refreshed. In order to show that to you a little bit further, we have the uh, measurement on the right here. Um, you can see um, we... Um, tested some samples before measurement uh, before soldering in gray and um, after the soldering in red and you can see um, they've been pretty much um, been restored after the soldering in so the capacitance drop of close to um, 0.5 microfarad basically has been negated by the soldering in um, yes uh, next, uh, we have to look at all these effects uh, 
combined. So for that, we will pick a um, 22 microfarad capacitor. We'll pick um, an X5R ceramic um, to let you know. And uh, usually X5R ceramics have a production tolerance of about 20%. So you might end up with 17.6 microfarad after that. Um, here we mostly um, focus on the worst case as this is the defining factor for uh, safe calculation. Um, on top of this production tolerance, there is the previously mentioned um, temperature tolerance with, for X5R is 15% in addition to that. So you end up in the worst case with uh, close to 15 microfarad. After that, there comes the most devastating effect, the DC bias effect. Um, for our part, um, it is rated for 10 volt and we apply 6 volt. So we have 55% um, voltage drop due to DC bias on top of that. However, we are still not done just yet. Um, there's still the aging that comes on top. So we would calculate for about 10,000 hours, which is about one and a half year. And this would cause um, a further 8% in capacitance loss. So after all these effects combines out of the 22 microfarads you used to have, in the best case, you have about 12 and a half microfarad, so close to half of the initial value. And in the worst case, you're down to 6.15 microfarad, which is pretty much uh, one quarter of the initial value. Um, you can use them like this, but you do need to make sure that you actually calculate all these effects to have a, say, a good safety margin in there. Otherwise, you might uh, end up um, having a capacitor with not enough capacitance after some time. Yes. Um, apart from that, there are some special match codes here I'd like to uh, mention. Um, if you ever have a failure for an MLCC, uh, the most common failure is uh, internal cracking. It's quite hard to see as this can be microscopic uh, fractures. For that, we have a soft termination of flex caps. They have a conductive polymer, you see in green here, which can balance some um, internal tension and bending or, and also vibrations. Um, you, normal parts um, can be bent on a 10 centimeter PCB uh, down to two millimeters, and these um, soft termination capacitors can be bent five millimeters on the PCB. Um, apart from that, there are also safety capacitors, um, which X1, X2, and Y2 uh, safety classes. I'll define them in a minute together with the film capacitors. And you can see on the right, the internal structure is basically multiple capacitors in series. Um, this way, we can limit um, the likelihood of um, failure mode um, ending up in a short circuit. Okay, when it comes to film capacitors, um, we have basically two ways to start. You can either go with a metal film, which is a little bit um, better when it comes to um, current capabilities and pulse voltage ranges. Um, but with the metallization on the dielectric, we can achieve higher capacitance values compared. Um, then you have the further choice um, of going either with a paper or plastic film, which nowadays more people tend to, or as time goes by, um, technology turns to, to plastic films. And these plastic films are then further defined by, by the coding. Um, you'll find um, polypropylene, for example, used in, in uh, safety capacitors quite a lot. Okay, um, when you look at the internal structure, you will see it explained here. Um, basically, you have a foil. Um, we have um, metallization here, so a plastic foil with metallization on one side, and this is rolled up to um, provide a compact size. Um, this is then um, pushed in an oval shape, and um, then we will add the shoe layer at the sides and the pins then the internal structure will be put in a, a casing and then it will be um, filled up with a, um, epoxide to protect against humidity. Um, yes, um, this internal structure has self-healing properties. So you'll have the um, metallization on both sides of the dielectric as it's rolled up. 
and whenever there's a um, failure mode, um, usually it's uh, penetrating the dielectric, um, you'll have an area with a short circuit and it's um, an area with a high current density, so very much current on a very um, small area, this um, generates heat. In fact, it generates so much heat that um, it will actually vaporize the metallization and even the um, dielectric in some cases, and then it can generate a plasma to further pull them apart. Um, so the surface area will decrease, um, but the capacitor will still work as a capacitor. Um, at the cost of a um, small loss of capacitance. Um, yes, as I mentioned, um, there are safety capacitors. These are available for MLCCs and um, film caps. There are different uh, ratings here. You have X capacitors to protect um, against um, voltage peaks. Um, it, they protect either the grid or your application from one another and X capacitors are usually used to filter differential mode applications, uh, interferences. Um, on the other hand, you have Y capacitors, which are usually used to uh, filter common mode interferences, and um, their capacitance um, is limited to not um, generate too much energy as they are used in uh, between N and Earth or L and Earth, or PE, um, and um, X capacitors are used between N and L, so between the lines. Um, in general, it's uh, nice to know that you can use Y capacitors as X capacitors, but you cannot use X capacitors as Y capacitors. And you see they have an impulse uh, voltage um, standing capability. Um, the Y1 has a, a highest, then it's Y2, then X1, and then X2. So you could use uh, Y1 also as an X2. Um, yes, um, that's uh, so far with safety capacitors. Um, as I mentioned, they are somewhat sensitive when it comes to um, humidity. And we protect them with an epoxide, but the epoxide is somewhat vulnerable when it comes to temperature um, variations. So we have the standard X2 capacitor, which is very cost effective um, and available in small sizes. But if you do want uh, longevity for this part, you can um, switch to THB types, which you can see on the bottom. They are a little bit bigger, but they have much better long lifetime as they protect much better against um, humidity and um, temperature changing. Uh, to show that further, we have the test on the right here. You can see we ran both types um, at a test for 1000 hours at 85 degrees and 85% humidity at um, full rate, rain, uh, voltage range, 310 volts. And you see the standard X2 capacitors will have um, a significant drop in the capacitance, um, about 40% roundabout, and the uh, THB types are not allowed to drop more than 10%, and uh, usually they'll be even less. So they do provide a, a big upside when it comes to longevity. This test here, however, um, is really extreme um, circumstances and it should not be operated in this um, range anyway but just for um, basic um, comparis comparison. Um, for um, film capacitors, we also have um, DC link capacitors available. Um, they have some upsides um, when it comes to um, aluminum capacitors, for example, when it comes to the voltage range and also the current capability. So in some cases you can replace multiple um, aluminum capacitors with just one um, film capacitor here. Um, they are, however, starting round about at 500 volts. So for the lower voltage levels, uh, you will still better off with the aluminum capacitor. As I just uh, started mentioning aluminum capacitors, we'll jump into them now. Here you see the basic structure of them. You have the um, anode foil, then you have the cathode foil, uh, the uh, paper foil layer in between, and then the cathode foil, and then another paper. And basically, you roll that up to have a compact size. 
and uh, have a huge surface area in this size. And um, this casing will then be soaked in a one of uh, in different materials, which I mentioned uh, on the next slide. But this case will then put be put in an aluminum can and then be sealed with a rubber seal to protect against mechanical influences and also against uh, drying out with the rubber seal. Um, so you can see the internal structure here. On the left, you can see the standard aluminum electrolyte part. And you can see um, on the left, you have the aluminum, then you have the aluminum oxide layer, which is defining the voltage range, range here. And uh, then you have the paper here, which is soaked uh, for this case in a liquid electrolyte. And then on the other hand, you have the um, cathode foil. Um, you see over time, this um, aluminum oxide layer can decrease in thickness, which would um, increase the capacitance, but decrease the voltage range. But um, as long as there's a little bit of water in the electrolyte here, um, and you apply voltage, you can have um, a certain self-heating ability here for this layer. Um, on the other hand, you have the uh, aluminum polymer types where we um, soak this paper in a liquid polymer and then we'll bake it to become a solid polymer. Um, during this process, the polymer will expand and as we have it rolled up, it will create some tension. So this is why we have a limit in the size we can produce here. Um, yeah. And um, on the third way here is the newest technology is the aluminum hybrid polymer types, which have um, both um, um, parts here. They are first dipped into the um, polymer, then baked, and then also uh, the um, liquid electrolyte is put in there under some pressure. Um, now we'll get into the three technologies one by one. So first we go into the aluminum electrolyte capacitor. You can see on the right here, they do have always a vent um, if the size is big enough uh, to have a controlled uh, failure mode here. And it's a well-established technology and very cost-effective. Um, as you can produce them in basically any size you want, uh, you have a huge range when it comes to capacitance value and also the voltage range. They do have uh, self-healing properties as soon as voltage is applied. And the lifetime is calculated as you can see here. So you need the basic endurance value you'll find in your data sheets, and then the um, maximum temperature and the actual um, applied temperature. And this formula states basically for every 10 degrees you stay below the maximum temperature range, you will double the lifetime. Um, the other technology is aluminum polymer types, a little bit newer and um, it provides advantages when it comes to the ESR as it has a lower one. It cannot dry out as it has a solid in it and no liquid. Um, it has um, a better lifetime, expected lifetimes. However, the size is limited. Um, it's very stable over temperature as there's no phase transition. So the electrolyte uh, cannot freeze or the polymer cannot freeze or um, uh, vaporize. You see they won't have a vent as it's not necessary because they have no failure mode uh, which would explode like the uh, electrolyte. Um, they do have however increased leakage currents which uh, you have to consider if you want to have a battery powered application as it might uh, drain your battery. Um, it is a um, solid internal structure the polymer and is somewhat susceptible to vibrations as it could break rather than just shake up a liquid. You see the lifetime calculation, calculation here is similar but a little bit different. So here it goes for every 20 degrees you stay below the temperature you will um, increase the lifetime by the factor of 10. So for the electrolyte it's 2 times 2 over 20 degrees so times 4 and here it's times 10, 10. So the further you increase the temperature, you can really um, gain the advantages over the standard electrolytes parts when it comes to lifetime. Here you can see the newest technology, the combination of both. Um, they will have a vent as, uh, uh, as an electrolyte if the size is big enough. Here you won't see it because the part we show here is rather small. Um, they are the most difficult to produce, however, as they have both production steps in them. 
as the polymer limits the maximal production size, it's limited in um, capacitance and voltage range. Um, in a lot of cases, however, it's, it can provide smaller um, case sizes than polymer or electrolyte, as it has better um, surface area contactation um, of the aluminum foil. It also has certain self-healing properties as a um, standard electrolyte part has. The lifetime calculation is the same as for the um, electrolyte parts, as we have to do the worst um, case uh, calculation here. But on the upside, it will start out usually with a much higher um, endurance value in the data sheet. So on the next slide here, I compare three, um, or basically uh, the three technologies with one another. They both have the, all have the same capacitance, voltage, and size. But you see the ESR for the electrolytic with 420 milliohm is not quite as good as, for example, the polymer with 14. But the hybrid gets really close to the polymer here. Same as for the um, current capability, you see electrolytic with 255 milliampere quite poor. The hybrid is quite good and the polymer is still the best here. Um, on the other hand, you see the electrolytic has very low leakage current, so very good. And the hybrid basically can take 100% of that advantage with them. But the polymer is rather poor with 400 uh, microampere here. Uh, when it comes to lifetime, you will see that the um, hybrid part um, with 10,000 hours far, um, is far the best by looking at the data sheet. However, if you do make a calculated lifetime scenario here at full ripple and 65 degrees, you can see the electrolytic part will last for about three and a half years, and the hybrid and polymer will last um, for, for more than 13 years. And this is where we cut it off. We want specify more than 13 years. You can also see in the graphs below that um, in blue and orange, the hybrid and polymer parts are rather close together, and the electrolytic is a little bit um, further apart from that. All right, this concludes uh, aluminum types. Um, now we'll go to um, uh, supercapacitors. Um, they provide very huge capacitance at cost of a limited voltage range. Um, they are somewhat susceptible when it comes to temperature uh, because their aging uh, progresses quick, quicker then. They provide very low ESR values, but rather high leakage currents. And on the right, you see the internal structure here. So you have the negative electrode on the left, then you have the Helmholtz double layer, and um, basically the cation solved in the electrolyte also, and the separator paper, you have the positive side. So they are very close together. It's all, the distance is only a couple atoms thick, which uh, allows very high capacitance values. Um, on the next slide, I'd like to show you how they age. So here you see the aging over 10 years. Um, and you can see on the left, the um, applied temperature range. And on the bottom, the applied voltage level. And on the right, the color coding says how much capacitance you lose. And to get a little more specific here, I'd like to pick two points here. So at 40 degrees, we'll apply 2.3 volts. And you will see after 10 years, you still have around 60% of the capacitance. And if you use um, 2.7 volts, you have only about 20% left. So this 0.4 volt really has a significant effect when it comes to the aging you see here. As the voltage is limited, and a lot of times you want to use um, at least five volts for your application, um, many people tend to use them in series. Um, and there you have to um, calculate for the worst case because they have a production tolerance of minus 10% and plus 30%. And um, this could um, cause an over voltage if one is, has a higher capacitance value than the other. So for the worst case here, we use the worst um, case with the max tolerance and the minimum tolerance. And then we have this formula where you can calculate with the um, uh, 5.4 volt um, for UT. And then you can calculate um, the over voltage of the capacitance with the lower capacitance is over three volts. And I just showed you how um, the aging of 0.4 volt uh, will 
affect the capacitor so you can see with over three volt the aging will um, increase quite significantly so this is why we say we definitely need a uh, balancing if we use more than one in series here okay if you uh, want further information on that please let us know we can supply some application notes and support notes on that but it's too much to get into that right now um, next uh, or then i'd like to conclude with a summary um, first of all, we have the MLCCs, which can uh, are available in the smallest size. They can provide a high voltage range. And here we have to um, go either with a class one ceramic, which will be very stable, but limited in capacitance, or you go with a class two ceramic, which provides huge capacitance, but it's not quite as stable. There are also safety capacitors available here. And uh, when you have uh, failure modes, you can try to fix them with um, soft terminations uh, if it's due to cracking. The next technologies are the film capacitors. They are very well suited for high voltage ranges. Um, they have self-healing properties. So you will also find safety capacitors here. They are, however, sensitive to humidity and high temperatures. Then there are the aluminum capacitors. Um, there's the standard aluminum electrolyte capacitor, which is the well-established technology and cost-efficient and can be basically produced in any size. There is the um, polymer part, which is um, well-suited when it comes to longevity. It also provides a good ESR value. However, you should not uh, or you should be careful when using it when it comes to battery-powered applications or high vibration applications. There's also the hybrid part, which combines the advantages of both these technologies. So it's very well suited for longevity and also for high temperature applications. Finally, there are the supercapacitors, which um, have a high capacitance, so you can try to replace your battery with it. However, if you use more than one in series, we strongly advise to use uh, internal balancing. Um, this would conclude the topics from my side. And now I'm looking forward to your questions. Um, if you have short questions, please ask them and we'll answer right away. If I have to go more in detail, um, please answer, uh, ask them anyway, and I'll uh, write you an email if we have to go more into detail about it. Thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for presenting today. We do have a few questions rolling on in. And as he mentioned, if you do have any questions, simply ask them in the questions box, the little question mark on there, and uh, we will try to answer them accordingly. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with a, a couple that have come in. Our first question here, is there a fail-safe way to protect against wrong polarity with electrolytic capacitors? Um, yes, there is. It depends on what kind of mounting style you have. Um, for example, for snap-ins, the bigger ones, there is a special snap-in, for example, for with the three pins, so you cannot apply them the wrong way. Um, there's also, for example, for the SMT types, um, we have a special match code. Um, WCAP minus um, ASNP, so non-polar, you can use them either way, so it won't matter. And uh, yeah, so there are ways. Okay, thank you. Uh, our second question here, what happens if you use the supercapacitor in the wrong polarity? Um, so supercapacitors in general have a polarity according to the data sheet. Um, in theory, they wouldn't have a um, polarity, but as we want to specify the lifetime um, uh, rather accurate, we have to make one um, electrode a little bit thicker than the other. So if you would use it the wrong way, it wouldn't um, break right away, but it would negatively, negatively affect the expected lifetime, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, another question, what happens if you use electrolytic capacitors that have been stored for uh, a long time or an extended period of time? Um, yes. So um, as I mentioned, there's an aluminum oxide layer which provides the distance between the two plates. And this will um, 
decrease over time. And um, the upside here is if you have a liquid electrolyte in there, so with the electro, uh, electrolyte, uh, aluminum electrolyte capacitors and the hybrids, um, this layer can repair if you apply the voltage uh, over an, uh, for a long enough time and high enough. Um, but this uh, layer will decrease and then you have a little bit more capacitance, but you have to um, test in the measurement for, for the voltage range that you can use. So you can repair them if you use, uh, start slowly with the voltage and raise it, but um, you have to be careful with the voltage, yeah. All right. Uh, our next question here, uh, for MLCC class two capacitors, since there is a voltage dependency, the parts capacitance value is defined for what voltage? Um, in general, the um, DC bias effect for class two MLCC is not defined. So you also, you always have to look um, at the at the information you can find. Um, it depends on which manufacturer you, you use. Sometimes you'll find calculated values. We do provide measured values, but um, it really depends um, uh, in general what kind of ceramic you use, what kind of size, and also uh, on the capacitor itself. As the ceramic, even if it's the same, it's never, well, if you have like an X5R, it doesn't have to be the same composition of it, but um, we have to have the same, um, temperature ranges and, and uh, changes over temperature. Thank you, Thomas. We do have a couple more questions here. Some of the questions are going very much in depth in an application. We would love to answer those questions offline. So <clears throat> please be on a lookout for an email either from Thomas or from the webinar team. Our next question, why are polymer capacitors not good for battery applications? Um, yeah, as I mentioned, they have um, um, higher leakage currents, so they might uh, drain the battery over time. So um, if you have them um, connected all the time and, and you've connected them for a couple of days, the battery might be drained. So um, yeah, be careful there. So then it's good to use the electrolyte or the hybrid parts instead. All right, um, looks like we have one more question here and then we are going to wrap up today's webinar. Uh, do you rate MLCC capacitor uh, capacitance values at zero hours or at some number of hours? For example, do you make them say um, plus 10% at zero hours so that the in application value is closer to the specified value? Um, I have to check that exactly. Um, so I think with that you mean the aging effect and um, in general you have, um, uh, if they are just produced so they won't have an aging um, and for our class one ceramics it won't be an issue uh, at all um, and for class two ceramics um, basically there is not a problem if you store them long because um, you will refresh them as soon as you solder them in. So um, the only issue you can have, it would be solderability, which we've never had any complaints so far. So um, we do a five times reflow flat test and if they pass five times, no, no customer desolders them five times. Um, what you wanna watch out for is if you um, assemble the PCB and then store that PCB for let's say five years in your warehouse because then there is aging and then um, you should um, consider or have to consider this aging effect um, for, for as well over the storage time, or you have to reach the 130 degrees again to reset them before usage, which can you can do with some PCBs, but some will have um, components which won't withstand this high temperature.
Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. I think uh, with that, we are going to wrap up today's Worth Electronic webinar. Uh, just remember, if you come up with a question a little bit later, or if we need to go in depth for an application, we are here for you. Just simply email us back. Uh, it's webinar team at we-online.com. So thank you very much, Thomas, for uh, doing today's presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar. And as I mentioned before, simply look for our follow-up email. We will include the recording in that email from webinar team at we-online.com. Uh, don't forget to follow Worth Electronics or myself on LinkedIn and you can learn about all upcoming webinars. And make sure you're listening to the Worth Electronic What's Up podcast, where each week we're bringing application notes, webinars, blogs, and press releases to an audio and video format. We go live Thursdays at 12 p.m. Central. That again is the What's Up podcast, and you can find it on all major podcast streaming networks like iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever else you like to listen to podcasts. So join us for next week's webinar as we team up with On Semi to bring you 25 kilowatt bi-directional fast DC charger that is on Tuesday, May 2nd. Register online at www.we-online.com slash webinars. I'm Amelia Thompson, and I hope to see you soon.